Hey guys, welcome, welcome back to my channel. My name is Mike. You guys are rocking with me on Mike's Intellectual Corner. On today's episode, we're uh, diving back into some epic history TV. This is how to build a perfect castle. And without further ado, just like always, we're just going to dive right into it. So. In Europe's Middle Ages, castles dominated not just warfare, but society itself. Strongholds are as old as war. But the medieval castle was unique. A refuge and a projection of military force. A lordly residence and symbol of power. A center of justice and government. Today, castle ruins are found from the Atlantic coast to the hills of Syria. Dramatic and poignant reminders of a lost feudal world. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, I think France, between France and like Germany, both of those have the same, the most um, castles out of any place in uh, the world. And I think like Britain is next, all by like Spain or something like that. If I'm not mistaken, I, I, I could be wrong, obviously, but keep going there. There was no single blueprint for the castle. Every one was unique. But by analyzing key trends over four centuries, Epic History TV is proud to present its guide to building the perfect castle. The medieval castle was the product of a feudal world, a world we'll explore with help from our video sponsor, Crusader Kings III. Using the in-game map, we can zoom in on 9th century France, the birthplace of feudalism. This was a time when royal authority was in crisis, as Frankish kings, the heirs of Charlemagne, struggled to control unruly nobles and fight off Viking armies. Increasingly, the king would grant a piece of land, known as a fief, and the promise of protection to a lord. The lord became the king's vassal, swearing an oath of loyalty or fealty, and providing military service when required. And if I'm not mistaken, the Magna Carta, if I'm not mistaken, was what, at least in England, was uh, what made it to where um, the king only had so many, you know, so many uh, things that they could do with their lords. Because before then, essentially, you know what I'm saying, um, the king could, if I'm not mistaken, could you use the lord essentially like anywhere he wanted to like that was essentially his, like his slave because they want and then that was the um lord or the king was the only person the lord could answer to if i'm not mistaken but i could be wrong totally but um but with the magna carta it gave it limited the king's role and made them you know uh, essentially a uh, a lord what you know made him feel like more of a lord instead of you know a pawn and the king what in you know the grander scheme of things but. these feudal lords began to build fortified bases across the land in which to live and from which to impose their authority on their new domains these were the first medieval castles when building a new castle the first and most important consideration is location. A castle should dominate the landscape, with good views in all directions, so hills are ideal. Steep slopes and river bends can be used to limit approach routes, making the site easier to defend. And for building work, a local source of stone, wood and soil is essential as transporting these materials over medieval roads is more expensive than the materials themselves. There must also be a secure local source of fresh water and food to sustain the castle's occupants. I was about to say, I'm pretty sure the surrounding, uh, you want to pick a place with surrounding um, fields and stuff that are prime for building farmlands and stuff like that. That way you could have, a, you know, essentially a crap ton of farmland around your area so that you can have um, essentially as many serves and as many 
people there to help defend it and all that stuff and help live and, and all that and sustain itself. A reliable starter castle is the Mott and Bailey, popular with the Normans, who built hundreds across England and Wales during the Norman Conquest. The Mott is a mound, either natural or built by hand, as seen here in the Bio Tapestry. It's not just a pile of mud, though. These coloured bands are thought to represent alternating layers of stone and clay, which will increase stability. Sometimes they even used stone or timber foundations. A typical mot is 8 metres high and up to 50 metres across. Its top can be defended by a simple wooden palisade and a tower, living quarters for the Lord and his entourage, and last refuge in case of attack. An earth ditch and palisade should enclose the bailey, to protect important buildings, such as a hall, stables, kitchen, stores, and a forge. Timber palisades are vulnerable to fire and rot, so will ideally be replaced by an enclosing stone wall, known as a curtain wall, as soon as possible. This creates the enceinte, or main defensive enclosure. The curtain wall should have crenellations to protect soldiers of the garrison during an attack as they shoot their bows or crossbows at the enemy. If I'm not mistaken, too, eventually on either side of the actual gate itself, you're going to want like um, actual tower, like enclosed tower, um, towers essentially, so that whenever somebody comes to your gate with a ramming or ram or something, you can hit them with, um, you know, flaming arrows or, or hot oil or whatever so that it breaks that down so they can't use it. Especially um, if it breaks it down right in front of it because then essentially they just clog their own way into trying to get into it. So now they have to come up with other things like a siege tower or trebuchets or ladders or just something like that that are probably could be a lot more uh, harder to use and try to get over to the wall and stuff like that. A concealed postern gate, or sally port, can be used during a siege to smuggle messages in and out of the castle, or to launch surprise attacks on the enemy. In parts of France, such as Anjou and Poitou, castle builders ignored the Mott and Bailey approach and constructed strong stone towers. In French, it's called a donjon, the origin of the word dungeon. In England, it's known as the keep. A keep offers better security and accommodation than a wooden tower. But if you try to build one on top of a mot, its weight will cause it to collapse. And if you guys don't know too, the Tower of London was used heavily, heavily in the War of the Roses, um, if I'm not mistaken. That was actually where uh, King Edward, I forgot which which one he was, um, uh, which uh, number he was in this session, but pretty much that's where um, one of the kings of England uh, essentially was murdered in that, assassinated in that castle during the War of the Roses and all that other stuff. So it's pretty pretty famous, but that is also under siege um, by the Tudors and by the uh, all them, by the Lancasters and all them. Uh, so that's been a, around for a while, because I think that was back in the 1400s that that war was taking place. So just a little fun fact, let's get into it. Some opt for a compromise, a shell keep, which keeps the mot and replaces its wooden palisade with a circular stone wall. But a truly imposing keep will have to be built from scratch on carefully prepared foundations. A typical early stone keep is rectangular, between two and four storeys high, with walls up to six metres thick. Construction might take up to ten years and cost a fortune. So large. For myself too, you see, I know you guys notice all those trees around the, the castle. For myself, if I was making a castle, I would want it to clear out all those trees around my castle to make essentially for 
a 360 killing field. Like, you know what I'm saying? You don't want anywhere for the enemy to be able to to hide or to set up, um, you know what I'm saying? Eventually, if you're further enough into the future, you don't want them to set up artillery uh, spots or trebuchet spots or whatever, you know what I'm saying? You want all of that cleared for as long as you can see. That way, they can't do anything. Uh, and it's just a huge killing field. You can just, you know what I'm saying, throw arrows out there all day long, essentially. But and cost a fortune, so large keeps are only built by monarchs and powerful nobles. The biggest keeps have towers at each corner. Within there might be a hall for meals and entertainment, private apartments, a chapel, and storerooms. A forebuilding creates an impressive and well-guarded entrance, which should be at first floor level, accessed by a wooden staircase which can be removed in case of attack. If the keep has a cellar, this is an ideal space to store extra provisions, not for chaining up prisoners in the dungeons of popular imagination. I mean, one even more thing that you could even add to that if you wanted to, uh, if you want to take the time to do it, um, is to even make a, a, a escape route, you know, going under the, the, the tower itself and under the, the wall, essentially out into you know what i'm saying maybe somewhere where you think that they might not be because you know, maybe an unfavorable place to set up an army and stuff like that just saying you could that might be another thing to do that way you're not you're not essentially keeping yourself uh sitting ducks as they as the enemy tries to figure out how they get in here because you know they're going to figure out how to get in there they figure out how to get across the wall they're going to get figure out how to get in there so just you know a thought it's Early keeps are square or rectangular, but later come in many shapes and sizes. King Philippe Augustus of France was particularly fond of circular keeps. Perhaps the most eye-catching of all is Castel del Monte in southern Italy, built by Emperor Frederick II. Its elaborate polygonal structure reminds us that the perfect castle must be elegant as well as formidable. The curtain wall should be strengthened by flanking towers at regular intervals. These project forward from the wall, so archers can shoot at attacking enemies with enfilade fire, or put another way, attackers will come under fire from the wall ahead of them as well as from towers to the right and left. Yeah, and that's essential for those uh, siege towers and stuff like that, especially for people trying to come up on ladders, because um, you got to remember, siege towers have their own way of protecting themselves. Essentially, at the very top of the siege tower is this little slit that has there. You, essentially, this tower has its own archers that are shooting back at those people who are on the bridge, who are kind of not... Um, protected by really anything but a square cylinder block like this so you want those towers that are jet jetting out like that because those archers are pretty much protected by a huge brick wall they're not going to get hit and those are the ones that are pretty much stopping those siege towers especially with you know flaming flaming uh um arrows and stuff like that being able to break those down and catch them on fire and all that stuff and especially if those siege towers are being uh, pulled by say oxen or any type of other um you know, a uh, domesticated animal that's all you gotta do is shoot them and they're dead. So, and that stops that track dead in its, uh, you know, in its track. So, let's keep on going. Square towers offer large amounts of extra space for living quarters and storage, but their corners are a weak point that can be targeted by enemy stone throwing artillery, such as a trebuchet. Or essentially, a trebuchet is essentially the only thing that can um, that can stop those those wall those big walls um, and break into them. But again, a trebuchet isn't always the most accurate thing, so that's why it's it's not you know what I'm saying always going to work. But if it works, you know what I'm saying that's pretty much the last place you want to be is in a, a concaving in tower. You know what I'm saying, especially in those days. But. So round towers may be a better option. The choice is often one of taste, fashion, 
and or cost. Square towers, round towers, and D-shaped towers were all common across Europe, and many castles feature a mix of types. In some places it was possible to cut costs by reusing old Roman fortifications, as at Pevensey and Porchester on England's south coast. Here the Normans simply built a stone keep within the walls of an old Roman shore fort, saving time, labour and money. Loopholes, or arrow slits, are important additions for any tower or wall section. The earliest versions are simple vertical slits, but from the 14th century more decorative cross shapes are common. In the event of a siege, Wooden hoardings, sometimes called bratis work, can be built out over the walls to allow the garrison to rain boiling water and rocks onto the attacking enemy. The obvious focus for an attack is the castle's main gate, so its defences, known as the gatehouse, must be especially strong. The ideal solution is to add towers on each side of the gateway, to add an outer and inner gate, and at least one, if not several, portcullises. These metal and I would make the entrance essentially as narrow as you can without making, you know what I'm saying, um, inconvenient for the people who actually live there, but that way if anything does break through that gate, they're essentially going to have to go into a super small tunnel, which on the other side, all you got to do is just start, you know what I'm saying, um, it's too easy to, to repel that from the other side, you know what I'm saying, it's just a funnel attack where all you got to do is keep that all right there, it's, it makes it way too easy. Not to mention, as all those soldiers are going through that hallway to try to get into the castle through that little small, that little narrow corridor, um, you got to think, all you got to do is start throwing down your hot oil, your hot water, all that stuff, and you gotta think of the the claustrophobia that takes full. It, it become a huge mess in that that corridor. So that's what I would do personally. These metal lattice gates can be dropped vertically to trap attackers in a kill zone. The garrison can then use murder holes in the ceiling and walls to finish off the intruders. The main gate can be further protected by a drawbridge over the outer moat or ditch, which can be raised by chains as an enemy approaches. Through the Middle Ages, gatehouses became increasingly powerful, with multiple drawbridges, gates and portcullises. The approach covered by looming towers, and every wall and ceiling studded with loopholes and murder holes. Some of the most formidable gatehouses are found in the castles built by Edward I to subdue Wales in the late 13th century. Such imposing wall defences began to make a massive keep seem superfluous, so many of these castles were built without a keep at all. Our castle is now an imposing fortress able to withstand a siege of several months, if properly provisioned. But to be considered truly epic, a castle should have a second curtain wall, enclosing an outer bailey, with its own tower. And for me personally, and this is, this is, you might see this as overkill, I would put two moats on either side of those two, with two drawbridges on on the outside on the outer outer wall and on the outside of the inner wall that way you have two different things right there to if they get if they breach the the outer wall you know what i'm saying they're just getting hit with a huge you know little mini river of you know crocodiles and everything else that i have in there so you know what i'm saying it's just a good luck it's a huge you know uh american ninja course you know what i'm saying they're not it's, it's not going to be nice it's not going to be a good day some wall enclosing an outer bailey, with its own towers and gatehouse. Gatehouses should be positioned at angles to the approach route, so any attacker has to twist and turn, rather than make a direct rush at the gate. 
towers and walls should now feature stone machicolations for dropping rocks on the enemy. Far more sophisticated than temporary wooden hoardings. The new outer bailey, or ward, allows more buildings to be brought within the castle's defences. Not forgetting that a medieval castle is as much a residence as fortification. Perhaps a new, grander hall. And if you wanted to, too, just for, just again, for overkill if you wanted to, you could even put like a little place, little station where you can even set up your tribuchets and your um, stuff like that. That way, you know, as soon as um, somebody comes, you can just start bringing your own tribuchets over there and start, you know, saying that way you can destroy theirs and, uh, you know, say, take away another, um, you know, saying, uh, thing that they have that can actually help them if you wanted to. Perhaps a new, grander hall for entertaining your household and important guests, kitchen gardens, and extra living quarters. The outer ditch or moat can be flooded with water to create an extra layer of defense. A water moat also. And on the outside of the, that, I'm telling you, I have ideas for days. I, have, I play too many freaking strategic games out there. But on the outside of the moats, um, outside of the moat, around the entire thing, I would put, you know, what I'm saying those um, some spiked, uh, what you call it, uh, spiked. Um, sharpened um logs and stuff like that you know what i'm saying why not put uh, put those on all the outside that way they can't it's gonna make it hard for them to try to get into those uh lakes and again um as long as you know you make sure you know kids are playing out there you know uh, when a uh, siege isn't taking place you can always have allig crocodiles alligators and stuff like that as long as you know I'm not, I'm not sure how uh good they would do in europe and stuff like that but i'm sure you can still do it extra layer of defense a water moat also has decorative value and can be a source of fresh fish. A final flourish, a barbican, an outlying fortification that adds yet another layer of defense to the main entrance. This is now a fine and formidable example of a concentric castle. Its design will force any attacker to overcome successive layers of strong defense to reach the final refuge the keep. If properly garrisoned and supplied, a castle like this was virtually impregnable until the age of gunpowder. As we have seen, there was no single blueprint for the medieval castle. Each was built to take advantage of the landscape. To and if you, anybody out there has actually been in any of these castles, it's pretty freaking wild inside. Like I, I've, I've been in the, um, I've been in to Transylvania. So I went to uh, Castle Bran, which is uh, Vlad the Impaler's castle. That freaking castle is humongous. Like it's the, one of the most pretty. Like it literally feels like you're stepping inside of a freaking millionaire's freaking home. But at the same time. It's almost weird to like some six two. So everything in there was made. You can tell was made for somebody who was like five 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 four. Like everything is so small. You feel claustrophobic walking around there. It almost feels like it was made for like a almost a child. Almost like for, compared to for someone like me, it's almost really weird to be in a, one of those weird one of these old castles because people back then were so small and you really get a sense of that whenever you walk into these places and see like what they were actually who they were actually built for because it wasn't someone like me like I would be very uncomfortable in, in like 90% of these castles because of how small they were made for but if you um if you haven't been in one I definitely recommend going to uh, one of these castles because this it would definitely blow your mind most of them. advantage of the landscape to incorporate the latest military thinking and reflect regional styles and personal taste. The most awe-inspiring examples from the castle's golden age include Crac des Chevaliers, the supposedly impregnable crusader fortress of the Knights Hospitaller. Dover Castle, known as the Key to England. And Malbork Castle, the gigantic, brick-built headquarters of the Teutonic Knights. By the 15th century, 
the castle's role was in steep decline, in part due to the rise of gunpowder weapons, such as cannon, but more fundamentally because the feudal world that gave rise to the castle had fallen away, to be replaced by professionalised armies and centralised royal authority. Yeah, I feel like uh, castles are made like essentially uh, for like either city states and stuff like that. Who like because you don't really need a castle for um, you know what I'm saying for a huge uh, country. Obviously, like he's saying, like because you just have a huge force that can um, protect your country outside of those outside of your borders or right at your border anyway. So you don't need you know what I'm saying these 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 don't really make sense or you know what I'm saying. Uh, makes sense in the long haul, but at the end of the day, um, again, a lot of these castles too, I'm sure were, if you think about it, probably not ice boxes, but essentially almost ice boxes, because I mean, there's no way to heat them up. There's no way to cool them down. There's if they're just huge stone uh, monuments that probably stink all to high heaven from the lack of, um, you know, what I'm saying of a really great. Uh, um, subsystem to, for, you know what I'm saying, for people to actually go to the bathroom and stuff like that. So, you know, you can, I'm sure all that had a reason or, you know, its own factor of why they all went down, declined down and stuff like that. But it is interesting to think about those parts of it. As the age of powerful feudal lords ended, so too did the age of the castle. Most would ultimately slide into ruin their military role replaced by artillery forts, their residential role taken over by palaces and stately homes, as the age of the castle gave way to the age of the chateau. Thanks again to our video sponsor, Crusader Kings 3. All right, guys, we'll go ahead and end it there. So yeah, just another um, different, uh, I guess, video to look at. Um, again, if you if you play like games like uh, Total War, um, Rome, or Total War uh, Alexander the Great and stuff like that, you always you have to deal with castles anyway. That's how I I learned a, a lot of my castle defenses because exactly what he was saying in, in there is exactly what you have to do in those games. They actually do a lot of pretty good research on stuff like that. But in any case, so uh, if you guys like the video, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Uh, don't forget to join me on my next one. I'll see you guys when I see you. I'm out. Peace.